So now, uh, after lunch, we go into the career session. And we have three speakers who I'll briefly ask, to ask them to introduce themselves in a second. Um, uh, there's going to be three talks followed by, we'll have a Q&A for everything at the end. And um, we, don't forget, sessions are recorded, so we can always go back to that. And you can put your questions in the Q&A session. Um, or at the end, if everybody puts their camera on and I can share it properly and see what's going on, uh, then we'll, uh, we'll, we can also do it in parallel uh, through people putting their, their hands up. So um, before the talks, if each of the three speakers could maybe just say a few words about themselves and then we'll go through the three talks in cycle. Just say that I'm Jerry Pritchard. I chair the uh, Royal Society of Biology Curriculum Committee, amongst other things, and I'm a Director of Education at the University of Birmingham, and I, I'm a plant scientist, a plant physiologist by training, but I'm just chairing the session. So name a brief introduction, please. Yep. Um, so hi, everyone. I'm Naima. I'm one of the tree health policy advisors at DEFRA. Um, we cover a range of things within sort of animal and plant health. But for tree, tree health policy in particular, it sort of centres around management of pests and diseases. So sort of priority pests and diseases. Lovely. Thank you. And Gerard? Hello, everybody. My name's Garant Parry. I'm the executive officer of the Association of Applied Biologists. I chair the plant sciences group at the Royal Society of Biology. And uh, I look forward to talking about my favorite topic for a few minutes, which is of course, myself. <laughs> Excellent, and over to you, Sarah. So I'm Sarah Gurr. I hold the chair in food security at the University of Exeter, but I've spent my whole career studying plant diseases. Although these days we have to call it plant health and not plant disease. So I'll try and tell you a little bit about what I've done. Okay, thank you. Look forward to it. So um, I'll go back to Naima uh, uh, for your 10 minutes. Over, you, over you, to you. Thank you. Hopefully you can see the slides. Yeah, that looks good. Great. Perfect. Okay, yeah. Uh, hi, everyone. So I was asked to sort of bring a bit of an early careers perspective and also perspective of someone that, that hasn't actually worked in uh, sort of long term and consistently in plant health. Um, and just sort of to reflect on that a little bit. Um, plant health is an area of policy that's sort of come full circle for me. I've tried different things sort of coming out of university um, to work in the environmental policy space, but sort of realizing that by far it's the area that I most enjoy working on. So briefly just to run through sort of my career path into tree health policy where I am now. So I studied environmental biology as my undergrad and at that time, I actually did a British Society of Plant Pathology studentship um, at RHS Wisley, actually in Jassy's team, who was speaking earlier today. Um, and that was an eight week uh, studentship looking at a number of different trials um, for trichoderma fungi as biocontrol agents. So that included sampling and culturing, testing culture against our malaria, which was a big piece of research at the lab at that, in the lab at that time. Um, genotyping, trichoderm species, PCR, inoculation trials, a whole range of things that I was able to get sort of stuck into. Um, and that, that studentship was really invaluable to me because it gave me sort of a level of independence to design and test things with the support of my supervisor and other sort of experts um, in the team where I previously didn't have that experience. And that work actually went on to be sort of the foundations for a PhD um, at Wisley with a paper published last year, which was very exciting. Um, I then went on to do a master's in conservation studies and I deliberately chose that as an interdisciplinary degree to sort of explore the social science side of things a bit more. I wasn't quite sure whether I wanted to pursue research or sort of more policy focus in my career. I didn't, I didn't really have a clear direction what I wanted to do. So that was really valuable for me. Um, again, postgraduate studies are a lot more independent and I think sets you up for starting in a working environment, but it also just gave me sort of a clearer direction of what I might want to do. So my first job coming out of that was actually at Nature Scott, which was formerly Scottish Natural Heritage at the time, um, working on license compliance monitoring. So protected species licenses and developing a compliance monitoring framework for those because there wasn't really um, a structured process in place at the organization. I then moved on to sort of working both in that role and as a licensing officer. So actually assessing applications for protected species licenses and 
coming out of university having studied conservation that was quite a challenging role for me because you sort of picture all these sort of positive changes that you want to make but actually in that post you're sometimes dealing with some quite some quite difficult change um, and challenging cases so for example big development projects where multiple species could be negatively impacted and you're also dealing with some quite tricky stakeholders who ultimately just want their license approved and you've got to sort of manage that expectation. Um, it taught me some really great skills that I actually use on a daily basis in my sort of plant health role now, specifically reading very technical legislation and familiarising myself with that and also understanding sort of expert advice that's coming in from um, species ecologists, protected area um, experts, a whole range of sort of research coming in, how to use that evidence to then support decision making. And that's something that I definitely do now um, in sort of a heavy plant health policy role. Um, an opportunity then came up for me in DEFRA um, in the flood defence capital investment programme, which I didn't know anything about flood defences <laughs> at the time, but um, again, lots of transferable skills. And I sort of viewed it as I was sort of starting to understand that I would actually really like to specialise in plant health policy, but I chose the job at DEFRA as sort of a means of getting my foot in the door and opening me up to other opportunities within that because then um, the plant health team was quite a lot bigger there compared to um, where I was. It did teach me a lot, again, sort of things that I use every day now about working in a high profile area. So flooding receives a lot of media and ministerial attention. I was often writing briefings, debates for ministers, speeches, correspondence, none of which I had any experience of before I joined that, um, that team in DEFRA. Um, and they're sort of more common skills that, that are sort of a whole different skill set to learn, really. So that brings me on to my current role where I am now. So, yeah, I've listed off a few of the things that we sort of do in the tree health policy team as part of our role. So outbreak response operational programs, commissioning research and making sure that research um, meets our policy needs. So again, that we can make informed decisions. But I just wanted to sort of highlight some of the things that I really like about my role to sort of give people a bit of an insight um, from that sort of policy perspective. So I really love the diversity of what I work on and not really knowing when you might be dealing with a new outbreak, for example. So we are now 18 months in, but I joined sort of relatively early on for, for our first ever recorded outbreaks of Phytophthora pluvialis in Europe. So as a team, we've had to sort of develop that policy and operations and, and research portfolio for something that's in many ways sort of entirely new. And that's been a really, really interesting process. Um, I like being able to link up and work closely with research and the risk and horizon scanning teams. So I feel like my role gives me insight into sort of a breadth of, of what else is going on in, in plant health in DEFRA and I get to really link up with those teams and be sort of kept in the loop even if I'm not directly working on something so it's sort of that ability to sort of continually learn um, about things happening in the space. Um, I very much enjoy the opportunity to go out on site and talk to experts and those carrying out the research but also the operational teams so those are the people that are sort of having to implement whatever policy we develop in practice. And we have to work closely with um, Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland to do that as well. So really trying to get an understanding of what's actually happening in the field really helps to inform that policy and is sort of a, a really great part of the job. Um, and linked to that is sort of the ability to work with my team to design entirely new policy and sometimes with that entirely new legislation. So, for example, we've recently had um, some oak procession remoth legislation that actually came into force yesterday. And that's an entirely new policy um, and regulation designed to allow traders and profe um, professional operators to move large oak trees where we already know oak procession remoth is established um, in sort of a risk based and biosecure way, meeting specific requirements. And we had to work really heavily with the sector and stakeholders to do that and, and sort of start from scratch, really, to, to put something together um, in quite a short amount of time. So that's been a really rewarding sort of project in the past few months. Finally, I just wanted to go through 
some of the skills I think are sort of most relevant for the role. As I said, this is sort of supposed to be an early careers presentation. And I thought, what you know, what are some of the skills that I think are really relevant to my job in case it helps people get a better understanding of what policy is like and whether that's something that they want to pursue a career in. So I won't go through all of them. Um, I've just pulled out a couple, but um, seeing the bigger picture is certainly one um, it's very, very relevant to my role in policy. So I'm currently working to draft the new tree health resilience strategy for 2024. And that requires you to think about the much wider, broader picture of where tree health sits, not just within the whole of plant health, but DEFRA's wider biosecurity strategies and priorities. Um, being adaptable is also incredibly sort of relevant and important. And this sums up for me some of the challenge in policy work and my role sometimes. It depends on your working style, but the job can fluctuate between very high priority, reactive, urgent commissions or, you know, responding to outbreaks. But that can change direction quite quickly to sort of a much more longer term, slower paced policy development. And I think sometimes that switch can be quite tricky because motivating yourself with those two styles of working, it does look quite different. And it's, um, yeah, it's sort of a very quick shift to something entirely different sometimes. And of course, ministerial steers and, and ministerial changes also require you to be adaptable because what is a priority one day, the next day, that can change. And, you know, we, we have to shift our priorities quite quickly sometimes. So just to sum up, um, I think I just sort of want to get the message across that I really enjoy in my role right now that my interests also correlate to my work. So this this job has given me loads of exciting training and development opportunities. And, you know, when I'm out on the week at the weekends on walks and things like that, I'm constantly sort of looking around me now, trying to learn and um, looking at suspicious looking trees. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it's it's been a really, really great role. And the plant health team at DEFRA is a, a really passionate group of people. Um, yeah, so any questions as fun civil service applications or any anything like that, I'm more than happy to to uh, for you to get in touch. Okay, okay thanks very much. That's, Thank you. that's brilliant. And that's a really nice reflective piece and it really sets the scene well. So don't forget, we'll take questions at the end uh, and please put the questions in Q&A in advance um, for all three speakers um, uh, and that, so we can in, have a really nice conversation at the end. Uh, so without any further ado then, over to you Gerard, um, let's hear about yourself. Yeah, thanks uh, Jeremy. That's a great, great talk, Neva. That's really great. I can, I can imagine you being out on a walk, giving the, the side eye to some suspicious ash or oak or something. I don't know. That's uh, that's a nice image. Okay, so this is this is very much a personal perspective on looking at my own career, not specifically in plant health, um, but um, but more in, in plant science generally. And you know the things that I found have been really useful, and maybe some advice I can you know provide what I think is important. So I start, this is right way back, I started uh, in South Wales at a comprehensive school where I did biology, geography and maths. I knew I liked biology, so I wanted to go to university to study that. So I did, I did a BSc with, uh, with virology because I had an interest in virology at the time um, at the University of Warwick. So, you know, that was fun. We had a good time. I didn't, uh, at that stage actually, which is I think highly relevant now, I didn't take opportunities to, uh, to do any like summer, um, get any summer experience for research experience mostly because there wasn't much of well there wasn't a huge amount available then this was in the mid late 90s um but also like many people i had to work over the summers in order to you know in order to to pay for the time i had at university and this is something that we've we, we were talking about even only yesterday at, a, at an rsb meeting about about those challenges of funding studentships when they're for 10 weeks when people are on holiday for for 15 weeks so you know have they, have they got five weeks on they're not making anything which can be important anyway at that stage um i knew i wanted after I, my undergrad I, I knew i wanted to do further study but i wasn't really sure what and i wasn't super great at getting getting organized but i maybe got a little bit uh, lucky i went back to the university of warwick to do an mres it was the very first year of mreses that came out in this thing called analytical biology which is very general but it was a really excellent stopgap for me. So a year where I had a, it was really broad uh, and it allowed me to learn about lots of things and definitely coalesced what I, what I wanted to do. 
and this was this then led on to to my my phd and this was key so i had a six month research placement in the in, in my mres and i worked with a guy called malcolm bennett at the university of nottingham and then he he offered me a phd off the back of that and the this is what you know one of the first things i want to highlight is about mentoring if you can find someone who you're really friendly with you get on with who can offer you advice throughout your career then then that, you know they're they're invaluable so really someone really useful to to hold, hold on to and chat to when you can they won't mind being now in a slightly more senior position they won't mind doing that because you get a real pride i think of, of people who you've you've worked with and are kind of going up through the system and malcolm really was my has been my most important work relationship from that time uh, and until you know more recently uh, since he was a real advocate for me when you know I wanted to get other positions so I finished my PhD and then um, then I then I went to the US to do a postdoc so my other point here I know many of you will be doing PhDs or many of you and the grads maybe on the call here and just bear in mind that a PhD or you know qualification in bioinformatics or science communication or anything like that they're, they're really global qualifications so they're highly highly relevant to go anywhere in the world so um you know if you have a PhD from the UK as most people on on the call you obviously are, are UK based um then you know that gives you the opportunity to go to the US or to France or to Germany or to Australia so English is the language of science so there shouldn't be any issues with that and it really gives you the opportunity to travel you know you know the majority of people will be in their mid to a mid 20s at the time so it really gives you the opportunity to to travel and I and I would absolutely recommend doing that so so as I said I went to the US lived just outside Chicago for a, for a few years um and got to visit you know Hawaii and the Grand Canyon and all the all the places that you might want to go so that's the other thing that I would give the advice so it's pretty simple but really enjoy yourself at this time so you want to be doing something and this is a general point throughout your career that you're that you're interested in so don't uh, don't settle for something that isn't go isn't isn't uh, isn't enjoyable to you since you will end up doing it for a long time and you won't have, be having a great time with it. So, however, at that time, then I wanted to get a a, a position, so a more permanent position. It's a few years until I got a permanent position, but then I went to uh, University of Liverpool as a lecturer. So I was there on a, a temporary contract for four years initially, hoping that I would continue. I had my own group and uh, had undergrad students and some PhD students as well so at the end, end of that time though it didn't quite work out as I had planned and then I became unemployed which is a bit of a uh, bit of a bummer at the time so I thought I you know I had a great position at Liverpool but uh, it didn't work out so I had to re then rethink you know I applied for the faculty position didn't quite get them over the line uh, ironically for what I do now my my research wasn't quite applied enough I don't think but uh, but it's uh, it was an opportunity for them for me to then rethink what I'm doing and and look for other opportunities. So don't get too down if your you know your perfect job isn't working out. Then you know there are always other opportunities that you might be able to uh, might be able to pick up on. So at that stage, then I moved sideways. I got a role where a BBC a BBSLC funded project called Garnet, which is involved with plant science for the uh, Rhabdopsis or the discovery-led plant science community, let's say. So that was based at uh, Cardiff University. It was essentially a, a bit of a postdoc position or kind of a research fellow position, but it gave me a lot of time also to do other things. And that's another key thing that I would uh, advise on you. So as a PhD student, as a postdoc, you have a bit more time to do a little extra, especially most people at that stage won't have a, won't have a family to consider. So really take the opportunity to, 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 to do other things and and pad out your CV to by by doing other things. So during that time, I was at Cardiff. I could be involved with with other activities. So I became involved with RSB at that point through the UK Plant Sciences Federation, which was involved with RSB. I mentored and supervised a team that did this iGEM project, which is a, which is this global synthetic biology project. Really great experiences and things which would have, have set me up for the for, for my future work. So the Garnet grant was five years. Uh, it didn't get extended. Uh, so I became unemployed. Well, I was ready to be unemployed again. I thought <laughs> that's another bummer. Um, but at that stage, I had developed quite a lot of connections through my work with Garnet. Um, so this was a really good opportunity for me. So this is the other thing, another thing that I would advise, you know, those connections you make, even if they're small things, 
know, make sure you you uh, maintain them and and discuss with people. Just keep in contact with people. Can it can be it can be very useful. So when I got the job with Garnet, it was very useful that uh, the person who was already working in that role I'd done my PhD with previously. Um, so you know that was a nice connection we had. And then the Garnet role was very much a national role that I interacted with lots of people um, and. Uh, you know, so I made lots of connections. So at that stage, my idea was that I was going to go freelance and organize events and organize uh, activities and workshops and kind of project manage a little bit. So I started my own business at that stage called Arabidopsis Events UK. Um, and that was going well for a while. So I worked with what Sarah Green, who spoke previously. So I was involved with the bacterial plant diseases project and uh, also involved, still involved with the Treescapes project. So really using the using the connections that I that I had from my previous work to to get enough work at least to keep me going but then ultimately another connection came through that I was asked to apply for a, a role at the Association of Applied Biologists by a previous colleague called Christine Foyer who's, who's a colleague of Jeremy's at, at, uh, at Birmingham and this was a role so the AAB is a learning society um, that is involved with obviously applied biologists in the context of plant and um, plant and agricultural science. So, um, you know, we organize events, but I'm involved with lots of other activities as well. And key to this, you know, I could have continued with my own freelance work, um, but obviously this is a little more uncertain. And AAB, uh, at the age of 47, I was able to sign my first permanent contract. So I'm not advising you that that's a good way to go about things in life. And that unfortunately is a, is a, is it the way that the academic life can go sometimes but uh, if you keep going you you can get there but again this is the opportunity for me to be involved in lots of other things so so i'm still involved with rsb i'm involved with lots of other organizations as well that i that i mentioned there and this really comes back to these this previous opportunities when you have opportunities to be involved then my advice would be to to take them, to embrace them, and, and and interact with as many people as you can in order to get the connections that might help you uh, in the future. So, very general advice um, that I would have: so search out those experiences. As I said, evidence all the skills that you have, all those trans translational skills that you have had during your PhD or during your undergrad that can be relevant. You know, motivate yourself. Be motivated to to learn about new topics because if you're interested in them, then you're gonna. Uh, you, you know, you're going to enjoy working on those things. Take advice from people. And then uh, definitely these days, you know, manage your online presence and your social media, um, just because that is always the first people. When people will always search your name and that will pop up um, for them. So if you um, put down a load of some, you know, controversial opinions that don't look good, then, then that's something you need to be aware of now. It's good to have a website for yourself, just a you know, just a placeholder, so people can see who you are and where you are. Um, but yeah, that's that's uh, yeah, that's my that's my general advice. So I'll leave it there. And if you have any questions, then we come back later. Thanks, Jim. Thanks, Karen. That's brilliant. Uh, I like the flow diagrams, uh, <laughs> and uh, uh, yeah, the advice about social media is well made. It can be a positive and a negative. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. So without further ado, over to Sarah uh, before we go into the questions. Again, I remind you, please put questions in the Q&A. Otherwise, I'll ask them all and that'll be really boring. OK. So, Sarah. Yes, I immediately have an issue trying to share my slides in so much as it says Microsoft Edge and I can't go beyond that. So oh, I wonder if somebody from the RSB can help here. Um, yeah, I have your slides ready, Sarah, if you want me to share them instead. Um, yes, is there any other way? Because I've slightly tweaked them, but it doesn't matter which one I speak to. Um, I've just got the ones that you've sent over. Okay, to that's fine. Family. And then can I control passing them on, Ellie? Or? Um, if you just let me know when you want to move to the okay. next slide, I can do that for you. <laughs> Thank Sorry you. Sorry about that, Sarah. It's These fine. Things are sent to try us. It's fine. So if we can go to the first slide and then Sarah can take control. Okay, so thank you for asking me. We've gone from early careers with NIMA through mid years with, with uh, Geraint to me with the twilight years of my career. So I'm going to talk about life cycles and a career with fungi. And I'm going to talk about what enthused me at the beginning, the passion and the path, 
then building a career, some highs and lows, and then ask, what is the shape of success? Can I have the next slide? So years ago, I grew up in Kent. My sisters all wanted to be medics. My father was a doctor and my mother was a nurse. So the pressure to become a medical student was unbelievable. But I looked around me and at that time, in the late 70s, early 80s, a very aggressive strain of the Dutch elm fungus had swept through from the continent up through England and then through Scotland, leaving in its wake 30 million dead elm trees. And at 15, I wanted to know what on earth was going on. And I found a paper that unbelievably was published in 1907 by Johanna Vesterdijk. She was the first female professor ever appointed in the Netherlands. So I read her work and I wanted to know more. Next slide, please. So in the school library, I found two books which literally changed my life. The first was published in 1940 by E.C. Large, and it's a series of stories or vignettes about individual diseases, including the Irish potato famine. Next slide. And so I found this book by Cecil Woodham Smith, which was the Irish potato famine, a social history, and I was completely hooked. And I decided I wanted to study plant diseases and not take up the medical school place that I was supposed to do. And so, next slide, please. I decided I was going to become a plant doctor. And I hope not too many similarities with this cartoon other than perhaps in the nose region. And I wanted to specialize in fungi. So, next slide. Being wicked in those days, I didn't bother with UCAS. I just got on the train and I knocked on the door of this eminent professor, RKS Wood, and said, I want to do plant disease biology. Can I come here? And he said, yes, come and start next week. So I started at Imperial College and did a degree there, had some fabulous teaching from Simon Archer and Bob Coots and became completely addicted to the idea that I wanted a career in plant disease. During the summer, I first of all worked in the mortuary, which wasn't very nice. Then I worked on the cross channel ferries and went backwards and forwards to France 120 times. And then I managed to find a job at Shell Research in Sittingbourne, which was relevant. And I worked on the mode of action of a fungicide that they had under discovery at that moment. And the lucky thing about that was when I graduated from Imperial, they offered me a job and I worked for Shell for a year. And then they sponsored my PhD, next slide please, back at Imperial College. So there I took up a PhD position uh, with my own project, which in retrospect was unbelievably naive because my thesis was called the biochemical basis of biotrophy and oomycete fungi. And we really do know now that fungi and oomycetes are not the same thing. So I worked on the basis looking across a range of different feedings at what made something biotrophic. Now the next career choice came because during the time I was at Imperial, I started a wine tasting society. And so at the end of my uh, postgraduate degree, I couldn't decide whether to go into academia or whether to go into the wine trade. But fortunately, I was sensible and I tried to become an academic. So next slide, please. So my PhD was incredibly biochemically biology, biology based. And I thought at that stage, I better learn some molecular biology. So I went up to the University of St. Andrews to do a postdoc. And there I also formed an association for the first time with what is now the James Hutton Institute. So I worked on Aspergillus and I also worked on a project that I got funded on Phytophthora. It was a very unhappy phase in the lab for all sorts of reasons that I don't think it's politically correct to go into, but it's not a lab that will be able to survive today. However, the good thing about it was that we all put our heads down and we wrote like mad, realizing that if we were going to succeed, we either published or we perished. So we wrote a lot of papers in the lab at that stage. And then I was really lucky. I moved down to the University of Leeds, not to study fungi at that point, but potato cyst nematode. And I was awarded a Royal Society University Research Fellowship. So I had a PhD at 24, a Royal Society Fellowship at 28, and a permanent job at 30. Next slide, please. Because I was offered a position in Cambridge as a lecturer. 24 hours after being offered in Cambridge, Oxford came up with a better deal. And this is almost hilariously funny because the department had opened in 1621 and the first woman academic appointment was me in Oxford. But because they were trying to outbid Cambridge at that time, they had to look around for what they called funny money. 
And what had happened when the Botany School opened in 1621 is the university had given a pot of money for the university shepherdess to look after all the sheep and all the animals on the meadows. So unbelievably, in my fight to show that a woman in science could succeed, I became the university shepherdess, which always causes great amusement. Anyway, so I stayed in Oxford for 21 years, progressing from lecturer, fellow at Somerville College, through to reader and professor. And then in 2013, the University of Exeter made me an offer I couldn't refuse. It literally doubled my salary and also took away vast amounts of teaching, but on the condition that I then became head of department, which I did in Exeter. So that brings me to where I am today. Next slide, please. So what have I done? So have I influenced plant disease or plant health? Well, I've te taught quite a lot of undergraduates, as you can see here, and I've also given quite a lot of tutorials. I've also been fantastically lucky with PhD students and postdocs. And of these PhD students and postdocs, two are now professors in their own right. Many are in academia, but others have done all sorts of different things, including one who's a very successful saffron grower in Norfolk. So I've published quite a lot of papers and I've been very fortunate to get them into relatively high impact journals. We've got several patents based on our fungicide or antifungal discovery and I really enjoy writing popular press articles. However, what I should say is when I started off, this was a hidden side of science to publish in something like the Royal Horticultural Society magazine or even in Country Life for which we were paid we actually wrote under pseudonyms because we thought we wouldn't be taken seriously if we published in our academic careers. But everything that I've done has been made possible by the excellent colleagues, PhD students and postdocs I've had. Next slide, please. So in terms of citizenship, I was the first woman president of the British Society of Plant Pathology, which is a society that's been really important throughout my career sat on the council of the BBSRC and I've done all sorts of other things but what I wanted to highlight at the moment is this job here which is as advisor to Scottish government through recess which is incredibly re rewarding. I much enjoy giving public awareness talks and I've been really lucky to have a whole series of awards and honours bestowed on me. Next slide please. So where am I in the apoptotic life cycle? Well I've grown up this the laughing one in the middle is me. Through university days, I have two girls who are grown up now and working. Charlotte is art editor at Nature, having read geology, and Alice read anthropology and social history, and is now working for a sustainable energy company in Oxford. So as I head towards this, what have I learned? Next slide, please. So here is my recipe for success. So it's a huge measure of effort, so a lot of hard work mixed with kindness, curiosity, honesty and integrity, an awful lot of teamwork, a huge dose of excitement, as much fairness as is possible and a touch of luck. And then you lightly dust this with a sprinkle of pride and you share as much as you can with your colleagues. Next slide. So bringing it full circle, Johanna Vesterdijk wrote in 1917, a boring, not a, sorry, I've misspelled that, a boring and monotonous life would kill even a fungus. Well, I've been fortunate. I don't think there's been a dull moment in my life, but she also wrote, working and partying forms healthy minds. I agree wholeheartedly. So my final slide is just really to thank those of my group who are current. So the last slide, please. So those people who are currently in my group and my colleagues around the world, and I hasten to add, this is not an extensive list of everybody I've worked with or who's worked with me over the years, but I've certainly had a very lucky career. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sarah. I, I doubt whether luck is the most important part of your success, but uh, that was a wonderful talk. Thank you. Okay. Um, so, panel, um, if everybody could um, put their, their um, evidence of stuff coming in the chat, but not necessarily in the Q&A. Um, so, okay, so Ellie couldn't see when, uh, the, because the questions were hidden by the screen sharing. So if people could now start um, adding some questions and or put your hands up and it would be nice if people's 
cameras were on. If you were going to ask a question, then we'll take it from there. I mean, I, I, all three speakers emphasise the importance of, of networking, the importance of hard work, but, but also the role of serendipity. So, so I have a question which was stimulated by, by Naima at the beginning, uh, describing those sequences. It, it, it pertains to, to all three speakers, but, but um, it, it, for each stage of your career, um, how did you feel that the previous stage had prepared you for it, facilitated uh, your, your, your progression? And how much did you subsequently get into something, the next stage where you had to do a lot of learning? Um, maybe if I could ask Neymar that first. Yeah, I, I think how, as I've gone along, there was a point a couple of years ago where I thought, hang on, I, I think I've done the wrong thing. I really love plant health and I'm so far away from plant health that I, you know, I'm now in floods or protected species. That I don't feel like I can come back to it. Um, I think what I've actually learned along the way is that for certain roles you do need that, you know, very specific, very technical knowledge, but you've always got skills that you've learned in previous roles that maybe at the time you didn't think that you know you were learning them and they're all transferable and they can all be applied for my role anyway and and for sort of roles in policy so I think it's sort of not not ruling myself out too early from something that you know might seem like it's a bit too ambitious or a bit too far away from where I've ended up um if that answers your question yeah yeah any comments from from the other two speakers so I think I was fortunate in knowing what I wanted to do very early on and then trying to conquer, which sounds funny in retrospect, trying to conquer shyness to actually go and ask for something. Like, for example, could I go to a particular university? Could I have a summer job? But the learning experience is a difficult one. So when I'd stopped my PhD and realized that I wanted to become more molecular, the skills of learning molecular biology were quite um, overwhelming to begin with. But then it became very much the language that everybody spoke and everybody did it. But more recently, I've started to look at mathematical modelling. And again, I thought that maths under that was absolutely overwhelming. But nothing is overwhelming if you just ask people to help. So without colleagues, none of the work I've done would have been possible. So it's really having the ability to go and get help when you want help and asking people, do you have time? And people almost always have time. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, so question about previous experiences helping where you are now, and that's that's clearly the case now. So, you know, I'm in a position where I lead a, a learned society, and I find that a lot of people in a similar situation to me or position to me don't have a scientific background. They are, uh, they work in societies or they, you know, but that's kind of their profession, whereas my previous profession was as a scientist so I'm a scientist obviously by training and that helps me hugely in in what I do it allows me to keep uh, you know have a scientific knowledge when I come to organize events and interact with people and that's uh, you know that's that's hugely beneficial so I guess the lesson from that is you know having that scientific background that obviously the majority of people on this call will have will prepare you for for roles that you might not imagine they're relevant for uh, in, in the future, certainly. So it, it's, it's, you know, obviously my, my, some of my knowledge is highly specific, but, you know, in, in general, it's, uh, it's also very transferable that having a scientific knowledge can be very useful in, in many, many different future careers. Yeah, thanks. And there's a question come up in the chat, which, which I'll um, uh, throw open, but, um, in particularly, again, because of the question I asked, um, Neva focused on you know work experience, and, and whether you get that within a degree or, or or more widely. And of course, Sarah got work experience in a mortuary, which I find quite quite sinister but fascinating. Uh, so the question in the chat is: Do you think funded opportunities for students, graduates to gain work experience have improved? But I think there's a broader question there about what sort of work experience and and what do you need, but. I suppose it's also nuanced by Sarah's point. If you, if you know where you're going, it's easy to, to answer. So maybe maybe we'll start with Sarah this time, if that's okay. Yes, there are a huge number of summer studentships. I just wrote a list for the department here about how many studentships were available and came up with over a hundred. I also tell that my duties, you know, every time 
every every year of your undergrad days you have to write a new cv and on your cv you have to add something that is work experience related so you build your cv as you go and even if it's only a week of voluntary work in a laboratory somewhere anything helps just to make yourself a bit different the other thing i try and do with my undergrads is try and encourage them to write something so we've had one woman or one young woman recently who wrote for farming farmers weekly you know just Get yourself out there. And the moment, Geraint said it, the moment people recognize your name, you're out there. So you have to be as bold as you can possibly be to go and ask for jobs or work experience or whatever. But the answer is, yes, there are definitely more studentships available for the summer vacations. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I mean, I agree. There obviously, there are more. It's kind of a, a little bit of a leading question from Cara since RSB does have over the last five years started studentships in, in plant health. But I mean, so there are more opportunities, but are there enough opportunities? Again, we were talking yesterday that, that the 12 studentships from through RSB and there are 20 or 15 studentships from BSPP for, for plant health. And then of course you can get plant focused studentships from, you know, from British Society of Cell Biology or Biochemical Society, but the, you know they're not earmarked for plant health in particular. But we, of the, for the twelve application for the twelve positions at um, R RSB, there were two hundred and eighty four uh, applications. So students are realizing that it's invaluable to have this sort of um, experience. But but whether there's enough uh, positions out there is is kind of questionable. I think we, we need more and more. We need people to support them more and more. That's that's for sure. Um that so so yeah so there are more yeah just to some there are more but probably not enough at the moment. Yeah. Have you got a question on that name or got a comment on that? Um no I entirely agree with what Sarah said in terms of opening your own doors and also I think work shadowing is inval like invaluable too even if you can't you know find that internship or that studentship um opportunities to just sort of see what other people do you know shadow someone for a week and just ask I was always sort of I think too afraid to do that at undergraduate level but you know people want other people to learn and they want to share what they're doing because they're passionate about it so um even if there's not a specific you know funded project or opportunity out there you can still you know just go and shadow and see what other people are doing Great, yeah, thanks. Um, another question then in the chat. Um, obviously, you can only comment on on backward looking with hindsight, although Sarah highlighted an area where she felt she needed to, to go and get the molecular experience. So, so what new roles and what new skills do you think are gonna be required in the plant health industry uh, in the future that might inform the sort of journey that, and advice that you've been talking about? Anybody like to pick that one up? I mean, I think I think primarily they they need we need people we need people with more interest and, and and expertise in in plant health, and then you know they will find the positions to get there. So I mean, again, at the risk of harking back to conversations we we've had very recently, but um, you know about need to incre increase the amount of plant health education or plant science education throughout throughout um, primary, secondary education, and then you will develop a, a cohort of people who are much more interested in this area, and then they will find the positions that, um, you know, that are, that are available um, for people. So, I mean, that's the, I think that's the key, key thing that needs to change. We need more plant science training within education. So I agree. I think it's a huge lack of awareness, not only with the general public, but also with politicians about the need of plight of plants to plant disease. It's incredible ignorance. I had a jolly good rant about it in Nature um, on May the 5th about the need to educate more people in plant sciences. And, you know, it's all very well spending billions on COVID, which is fine. And that's exactly what we should have done. But when you look at the amount we spent on COVID versus what we spend on plant disease per year, it's quite shameful. And basically, if we don't have enough calories to eat, then we won't get some of these diseases anyway. So we see... We need something to raise the awareness of, of what we do to the level of the World Health Authority. Anyway, it's on May the 5th. It's a big rant about addressing the urgency of crop disease. And I think, in a way, I get away with it because I'm more senior and in the twilight years. I'm not sure I would have had a rant like that age 30, but there we are. <laughs> that's, that's interesting. So, so do you think if you had, that would have been a problem, Sarah? 
Or do um, you just think it wouldn't have had the traction? I don't think it would have had the traction because it was based on having published some reasonable other papers which were evidence-based rather than just a, a rant about it. But I actually even quantified the numbers of papers published in COVID versus the numbers of papers published in plant health. And it was a bit shocking, really. And then I thought, well, wouldn't it be interesting if we went out into the street and did a survey and you asked a thousand people what the most important diseases were? I don't think one single person in 1,000 would say anything about crops, which is a pity. So it's incumbent on us, and I wholeheartedly agree with Geraint, that we need to educate from primary school up. And what better story, really, than to tell the Irish potato famine again? Yeah, absolutely. Which Charles Darwin apparently funded somebody to look at Phytophthora in 1842. So there you go. He was involved. Name, have you any comments on that? Particularly, the, the, the I think the core of the question... Uh, it's interesting about the education side of it, and we'll hear in the next session about some public communication aspects to that, which will presumably also help. But about the new skills, is there anything forward looking, Neymar, that you see developing or that you, you think people will need that are additional, perhaps? I I mean, I think this just touched on sort of what's already been said, but sort of going back to Jake's talk earlier in the day of that citizen science and, you know, not necessarily specific roles, but that, that stewardship. And I think that's a developing area within our team, this sort of the social science side of things and the social research side of things and that social value um, and trying to incorporate that into policy because it's not, you know, it's not easy to qu uh, quantify. It's not easy to sometimes evidence in a way that those economic and environmental values can be. And that's a big piece of work for us moving forward is, how, yeah, how do we sort of better take account of that of that value and also the communications behind that to um bring more people on board so that we're not just yeah sometimes i feel like especially with some of the reactive work where we we're dealing with specific pests and diseases in tree health it's trying to be to take a step back and be mindful you know in our land management approaches and our wider approaches to everything before we've got a problem how can we manage this environment in a way that takes account of those sort of plant health needs rather than responding when something's happening. Yeah, I, I think that's a really good point. And I think one of the things that's emerging from the discussion is the the, the, na the broader nature of the skills that are needed away from just the science that Geraint touched on. And a lot, a lot of times now, a lot of universities are starting to think much more about interdisciplinary yeah. um, uh, teaching. So you've got the core science, but how do you uh, translate that into impact? So can I say something, Jeremy? Just have sure, a wait. Absolutely. Sorry, I don't mean to interrupt you. I think one of the skills that we desperately need is, again, in the wake of COVID, everyone now knows what R0 is, but we don't have very much decent plant disease epidemiological modelling. So we need to be more proactive than reactive, which is what Naima said. But we need we need these skills, and to get these skills, we definitely need to go into disciplinary. Yeah. Just to pick up on the primary thing and also to blow the trumpet of the RSB again, and the curriculum committee has published a curriculum framework which picks up primary and there are currently working groups looking at the, the plant science stuff of that across primary through to age 19. So the RSB is actually quite active in that as well, just to, to blow the trumpet for that committee as well. Um, there's a specific question for Geraint um, about, and, and I think it's quite interesting, about the challenge about transitioning out of and back into to academia. With hindsight, you've obviously succeeded, but it must have been pretty frightening at the time. Yeah, I mean, you're opening up the wounds here, Jerry, with this one. But uh, <laughs> wasn't yeah, me. I think mean, that's the question. <laughs> so, yeah, no, it was. Uh, it, it was. It was a bit tough. I mean, you you've been working. You know, my my career was working to towards an academic position, which I achieved, and then that was, uh, um, you know, that kind of was put on hold. And I had the opportunity to, you know, to apply for other positions and I was getting interviews. So you're getting close, but I'd been unemployed for six months and you have to make a decision at that point, whether I keep going and probably would, I, I, I imagine I would have got a position in the end or, you know, I, there was another opportunity to, to go in a different, a different direction. So yeah, it was, it was definitely tough. I can't say it was, it was an easy time. I mean, it was fine. It, it wasn't anything terrible, but, uh, but I mean, I, um, yeah, it was it was difficult when I first went to conferences. So I started to I, the position I moved into was involved with a lot of organization of events and things. 
Um, and when I went to conferences, the conversations you have are very different now. When you used to go to conferences as an academic or, or a postdoc or PhD student, you know, you're, you're working on a specific project and therefore you talk very detailed about that project. And those are conversations I don't have anymore. I mean, I have some knowledge, but I talk in a much more general way with with people. And for the past, for the first couple of years, it was quite difficult to get get used to that. I mean, kind of first world problems we're talking about here a little bit, but uh, but it was uh, yeah, it was a bit a bit of a challenging tra transition. But ultimately, you know, I had a, obviously a, a, a set of skills behind me that I could hopefully have found a way. And now, you know, this hindsight is twenty twenty, of course, but. But now I have a you know permanent position. I interact with scientists all the time. I'm involved in lots of different areas of science, um, and I don't have the uncertainty of writing grants, which is something that I I don't envy my you know my uh, colleagues who are you know similar age and, and 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 many of them haven't you know they've transitioned away from doing research anyway. I, and I think I'm staying much closer to the to the to the science, even though I'm not doing it myself at the moment. So yeah, it was tough, but in the end, it's worked out. I think. Okay, we're just we're over time, but I think we just we have got a thirty minute break. So I think I think we'll just take a one more because some of the questions are actually getting answered in in the chat. So uh, which is good, but but there's a question there about tips for juggling parenthood. But I think we could broaden that more widely to people with caring responsibilities and other issues as well. Um, and a, a sort of plea there: Can you be taken seriously if you're part time? Uh, anybody had experience of that, either personally or or um, uh, indirectly. I can only tell you how fortunate you are to live in this world at this time. So when I was interviewed for an academic job, one of the questions was, will you have children or not? I mean, that was actually something that was career deciding. And then when I had my children, I actually left it so late giving the birth to the second one because I was lecturing that I gave birth in the car park. So, yeah. I mean, fortunately, things have changed these days and childcare was really quite problematic. It was expensive and you had to almost hide the fact that as a serious woman in academia, you even had children. Thank goodness things have changed and both for men and women, it is much easier. And if you keep writing, even if you do part time, you can always keep a really good trail going on. So I've got a part time intern at the moment. She's only working 20 hours a week because she's got young children. But during the rest of the time, she's trying to spend two or three hours actually writing an article. So, yes, if you can juggle it and the children behave well, you can manage. But it's 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 both rewarding and exhausting, I think. Any other final comments on that one before we close? Yeah, I mean, I can't. I mean, I've got two young children now, uh, three and five. But uh, but, you know, I, it's a bit different for me. A man, I'm a bit older. Uh, you know, my partner does obviously she works well she works full-time as well but it's 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 always a challenge to juggle the part-time thing I think it's Sarah gives the best advice there if you are part-time you're still you are still working though you're still producing things and and these days allowances you know are made for for these career breaks and things like that so you know I, I'm not sure what advice I'm giving here but uh, you know you should have a baby if you want to have a baby I guess is my advice Okay, I think we'll draw it to a close. I mean, that was fascinating and, and, and a really diverse but complementary set of talks. And, and, and I think to reassure people in the room, a career always looks brilliantly planned with hindsight, and it's often not. And it's the serendipity that people brought up um, um, that, that, that is important. So what I took from it was, you know, it's about building networks, finding allies, making friends, and most of all, enjoying it.